Hello and welcome to another review video, this one being for unit three on sensation and perception. It's gonna be fast again, so make sure you click below to grab the study guide that I've made to accompany this. You don't absolutely need it. It might, it's really basic what I've made, but it might be helpful. Otherwise, just have a piece of paper and get ready to go. Unit understandings for this unit include obviously sensation and perception, but there's some specifics underneath sensation there. I wanna point your attention to the skills. So according to College Board CED, they released to teachers all about everything you need to know. All of it falls under, similar to last unit, concept understanding, and that everything about sensation and perception, you need to make sure you understand and can apply to a given scenario, except for um, chemical senses. Chemical senses being smell and taste, and being able to, um, it's skill three, which is scientific investigation, being able to analyze psychological research studies. So this could very much be on that second FRQ um, and be ready to kind of analyze some of the research and, and apply your knowledge. Okay, we're gonna go kind of quick through um, what I deemed intro to sensation and that set of notes that we have. So understanding processing and how from the bottom up, meaning bottom up processing, we are simply using our senses to make decisions about a new stimuli or thing that we see. Whereas top down is where we are using our experiences and our expectations, meaning our higher order thinking brain to decipher and make decisions about a new, a new thing. Thresholds. There's lots of things to understand with thresholds um, that we have absolute ones, which means that they don't change, but it also means that we are able to detect a stimuli 50% of the time. And if we're able to do that, the stimulus has met our absolute threshold. Then there's JND or just noticeable difference, um, which is that the stimulus is there. It's how much of the stimulus is needed to change, right? how much of a difference is needed in order for us to detect the difference 50% of the time. And then Weber's law simply just says that JND is proportionate and that if the original stimulus is small, then the change only needs to be small in order for us to detect that difference. Likewise, if it's large, like a really loud stimulus or a really heavy stimulus, then we need more of a change in order to detect that difference. Of course, there's the subliminal threshold or subliminal messages in that um, it's underneath our absolute threshold, but does it really still impact us? It's kind of up in the air, but no, not really. And then there's signal detection theory, which sim simply says that we don't have absolute thresholds, that our thresholds depend on things like our motivation, our expectations, our level of fatigue, and background stimulus. Gestalt grouping says that we our brains like whole pictures and that the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts and that our brain likes to perceive the whole rather than the individual parts. So make sure you go over things like figure ground um, and closure, connectedness, similarity, proximity, um, all of those gestalt grouping principles as to why we see things as a whole. For instance, on a basketball court, and you see the two teams, right? You see all of the yellow uniforms as one entity and you see all of the blue uniforms as one entity. That's just an example of similarity. And then there's depth perception, knowing the difference between monocular, only needing one eye to perceive depth, or binocular cues, meaning you need both eyes. Monocular cues include linear perspective, interposition, those sorts of things. Binocular depth cues um, include convergence, right? That our eyes converge upon each other as the item is perceived to be closer. And then there's also retinal disparity. The greater the difference in our two retinal images, right? Images on our retinas, um, the closer we perceive that item to be. All right, so the first sensation, right? The sensory organ that we talk about is vision, making sure that you understand all of the parts of the eye and in order as well as function. So cornea, 
Then there's the pupil controlled by the iris, which is the colorful muscle that then dilates or contracts the pupil. And then the lens refracts and turns upside down the image and projects it onto the retina where there is the fovea. And in the fovea are cones, outside of the fovea are rods. And then there's bipolar and then ganglion cells that all work into the optic nerve. The optic nerve, where it leaves the eye, there are no sensory receptors there. There's no rods and cones. So we actually have a blind spot in each of our eyes, but we don't see them because we have two eyes and they can make up for the blind spots. You also make sure that you understand the color vision theories. Trichromatic theory says that we have three colored cones in our eye and that a combination of any of those is how we see all of the colors. And then opponent process theory says that we have three pairs, red and green, okay, blue and yellow, and black and white. And after images are kind of evidence of the opponent process theory. Then there's audition or hearing, right? Making sure that you understand all parts of the ear, including the pinna, which is the part that you pierce. It's just a funnel to the auditory canal, which you clean out with a Q-tip. And then there's the eardrum that vibrates to send the message to the three bones of the middle ear. Then it goes to the semicircular canals and then to the cochlea where the basal or membrane is. And inside of that fluid filled cochlea are the hair cells. The hair cells vibrate with which is where transduction occurs and the information is sent to the auditory nerve. Um, also know the theories of hearing, like frequency and pitch theory. Frequency being the frequency of the sound wave continues in the basal or membrane, the fluid of our ear. Whereas pitch theory, the, um, the pitch of the wave hits our cochlea in a certain spot, allowing us to perceive pitch. Then there's hearing loss, noise induced hearing loss, meaning as soon as you start hearing things, you start accumulating damage to your hair cells. And as you age and therefore use those hair cells, you lose the ability to hear higher and higher pitch sounds. Conduction deafness is damage to the mechanical parts of the ear, including the eardrum and all of the middle ear, which can be helped by a hearing aid. And then there's sensory neural deafness, which is anywhere from the cochlea and back. That would be um, the sensory neural deafness, um, which cannot be cured at all. Um, it can be aided slightly with a cochlear implant, but there's lots of um, kind of controversy around a cochlear implant. And then there's sensations. So I need to point out something here to you that's really important because College Board tells us that chemical senses, we're gonna need to be able to analyze psychological research with chemical senses. Our chemical senses are gustation, which is taste, and olfaction. They are chemical senses because chemicals from our environment actually enter our body. That's how we get sick through our nose and through our mouth, okay? That's why you're not supposed to touch your face because you have molecules on your skin that aren't gonna get into your skin, but they'll get into your body through your nose and your mouth. So the next time that someone around you passes gas and you smell it, just to think, it's a molecular chemical sense. So the molecules that were just in their rear end are now up your nose. Enjoy that one. Okay, and then there's the somatic senses, which are senses of the skin, and we are able to sense pressure, temperature, vibration, and pain. And then the very last thing of the whole unit that I'll briefly talk about, make sure you go back through and study your vocab and really test yourself, is vestibular sense versus kinesthesis. Vestibular, vestibular sense is controlled in your semicircular canals and it's what kind of gives you motion sickness because it is your awareness of your body in space and that if somehow you are upside down, your body knows that you are upside down because of the fluid in your semicircular canals. And then kinesthesis is the awareness of your body in regards to itself and that you do not have to look at your finger and look at your nose and back and forth, go back and forth just to touch your nose. I say touch your nose or your finger, you simply do it. You don't even have to look at it. Um, and so that's how you're able to clap as well so that you don't go like that. Like, oh, oh, I really got to watch my hands and make sure they come together. No, your hands know where they are in regards to each other because of kinesthesis.
Okay, so I totally lied. That's not the last thing we're going to talk about because I forgot about perception. Okay, so perception of movement. You'll want to make sure you go back over your vocab with stroboscopic movement and the phi phenomenon. Um, which is just how we use light to make us perceive motion and that our eyes do not see anything moving. But because of the way the lights are moving in some of these cases, our brain th sees that movement. And then there's perceptual constancy in that our brains understand that the size of items stay the same, even though the size on our retina, what we are sensing, changes. This is um, size constancy is being able to squish someone, right? When they're really far away from you and you can squish them, that's size constancy. And we know that they actually are the same size. And we can say, uh, I, even though they're this big on my retina, I would say they're about six feet tall. Um, and then there's the illusions like the Ponzo, Mueller Lions, and Moon illusion, making sure that you understand how depth cues especially are used really in all of these to totally throw our brains off and make us perceive depth in, in incorrect ways. And then there's perceptual set, making sure you understand that cultural context is really important in perceptual set and that what we have been exposed to throughout our lives very much determines how we are able to perceive different things um, and having examples of those is really important. So I would encourage you to look back in those notes about how culture influences those um, as well as schema and that as we develop our understanding of concepts and what makes things certain things and not other things, like what makes a chair a chair and not a bar stool and what makes an SUV an SUV and not a sedan or a truck, right? Understanding all of those things kind of sets us up in our perceptual set in being able to or not being able to perceive things a certain way. Now that is officially the end of unit three with sensation and perception. I know it was fast, so make sure you rewind and pause and then we'll see you for unit four here soon. Bye for now.